So we're going to talk about power series this week, maybe get into Taylor series, which are a special kind of power series, although that hasn't been unlocked on Canvas yet. And power series, I keep making this, uh, this typo where instead of writing, um, writing, I think we use N, I, whatever, where instead of writing I's, I've written X's, and I kept um, making that typo because the most common application of series is not these series we've been looking at, where we just have N's. It's series that look like this. We've got, I guess we've, I don't know why I decided to switch. We've been using N very consistently. Um, where we've got our Ns, but we've also got Xs. So something that looks like this. And something that looks like this is called a power series. Um, and I guess trying to take the very vague something that looks like this and beat it into a more formal definition. We've got an A sub N, and then we've got an X to the N. Let me put an N there. This, as I say, is called a power series for the hope for the obvious reason that X is being raised to a power. And a power series then is basically, again, talking about this a little mushily. But it's an infinite degree polynomial. And because a power series has X in it, there are complications that occur with power series um, that do not occur with the other series we've been looking at. Um, maybe the most evident complication is that it really doesn't make sense to ask whether the series converges or diverges, because the answer is going to be, uh, well, it depends on X. Like maybe if X is really big, the series diverges, but if X is small, the series converges. So we're going to start by remarking that power series are a type of function. You know, every input X either gives an output if the series converges, or maybe it doesn't give an output, maybe it diverges. But if it doesn't give an output, that's perfectly fine. Um, it just means that X isn't in the domain of the function we've defined. So we're going to talk about power series kind of technically today. We're going to talk about, you know, adding them and multiplying them and taking their derivatives and their integrals and stuff. Before we do that, because I think if we just dive right into that, it's going to be sort of, well, what's any of this for? Um, 
we should talk about, well, what's any of this for? What's the point of these? And the point of these is that complex functions can often be um, approximated with, well, let's say with polynomials for now. Let's look, let's see if I hopefully can remember this. <laughs> let's look at e to the x, the exponential function. And then let's look at the polynomial, the linear polynomial, one plus x. Well, these functions don't seem to have a whole lot in common, but if you sort of zoom in, I don't say, I don't know why I said sort of, if you zoom in around the y-axis, you'll see that these functions actually have a lot in common, or at least they have a lot in common when x is close to zero. Now, it might not seem like e to the x is a super complicated function, but I mean, imagine trying to explain this to like a, um, well, a college algebra student or a 102 student. And I mean, in particular, trying to explain this e to them. What's E? Well, if you take the limit of 1 plus 1 over x, no, 1 plus 1 over x raised to the power of x, as x goes to infinity, that will be E, I think. I sort of am struggling to recall it myself, to be honest. So even though, I mean, in calculus, we're used to thinking of E as being a simple thing because its derivative and its integral are simple. Um, it's quite complicated in sort of non-calculus terms. Let's continue and create, make a um, slightly higher degree polynomial. We made a degree two polynomial, and obviously I'm doing this in a very specific way that we'll talk about when we get to Taylor series. Um, Notice that our approximation has become better. Our approximation was initially only really good around here. It stops being good somewhere around where that mouse cursor is. We add this next term, and now it keeps being good a little while longer. And we can make this approximation better and better So you see, um, it's still not wonderful down here. It takes a little while to really um, get 
good in the negative direction. Well, <clears throat> that's actually an optical illusion. It looks like it takes longer to get good because we can see the entire curve. Um, you know, we can see this part of the curve. Actually, it's taking the same amount of time in the positive and negative direction. But, um, or approximately the same amount of time. But we can make our approximations better and better if we, you know, know how they're being done. In this case, the pattern is probably pretty clear um, by making the degree bigger and bigger. And of course, on Desmos, at some point, we have to stop. At some point, I get sick of putting in those higher degree terms, and I come back to the whiteboard. But the germ of our idea is that a complex function might not just be approximatable, a complex function might equal a polynomial if you let the polynomial have an infinite degree. The approximation seems to get better and better as our degree gets bigger and bigger. So if our degree were infinite, if instead of a polynomial, we had a power series, we might be able to say that something like e to the x equals an infinite degree polynomial, equals its power series. And I mean, even putting that aside, Because, of course, you might then say, well, but Desmos and Wolfram Alpha and whatever algebra system I'm using can't handle infinite, you know, stuff. So sort of what's the point? But even this approximation, I mean, this idea of approximation is an extremely powerful Cool. Let me go back to Desmos and hopefully I'm not about to make a fool of myself. Let's look at e to the x squared. Okay, so same thing, e to the x squared and 1 plus x squared look the same until they don't anymore. We have an approximation. Our approximation is good near zero. It's bad everywhere else. Come on, Desmos, you are such a pain in the butt sometimes. Uh, so what do I want? I want x squared squared. And our approximation, you see, now becomes stronger. And if we take this approximation, which was approximating e to the x, and we replace all of the x's with x squared,
Squares. Now we're approximating e to the x squared. And here is the power of that. e to the x squared versus 1 plus x squared plus x to the fourth over 2 uh, plus x to the sixth over 6. Plus x to the eighth over four factorial, one times two is two, times three is six, times four is 24. So near the origin, we have seen that these things are very similar. But in terms of calculus, e to the x squared, now I won't give a number to this, I'll just say probably the main thing, e to the x squared is impossible to integrate by hand. Not u substitution, not um, integration by parts, nor partial fractions, nor powers of trig functions, nor trigonometric substitution, nor anything else we could possibly do will allow us to integrate e to the x squared pen and paper. Whereas an eighth degree polynomial is about the easiest thing in the world to integrate. Let's see. Uh, nine times. 24, whatever that might be, a calculator could tell us. So doing integral calculus with um, a polynomial is always nice. It's always easy. Even if the polynomial is kind of weird looking and has these factorials in them for some reason, <laughs> integrating it is straightforward. One, the constant turns into the constant times x. Everything else, the power bumps up by one, and then we divide by two. So the division by two, to be clear, is why these denominators have changed. You know, just picking one of these, this six bumped up to seven, and then we divided by seven. Seven times six is where the 42 came from. So the great application of this is that we can replace impossible to work with functions 
pues easy. Oh, wow. Pues functions as long as and here I'm going to kind of wave my hand over the first part as long as a few minor conditions are satisfied. That's the hand wavy part. We might or might not talk about this more. Um, as long as a few minor conditions are satisfied and X and the variable, how should I put this? Is only ranging across, I think I'm missing a C there, but whatever. X is limited. We're not just looking at every possible value of x. And I mean, in this example, we replaced this sort of impossible to do calculus function with this easy to do out to this with function. And be, let's see, because exponentials grow so fast, I think if I just zoom out, I'm going to kind of get gibberish. What I'd like to do instead, there we go, is increase the window. So we see um, this approximation that looked so nice is nice, but now we can look at the x-axis and we can say, well, it's a really nice approximation until it isn't anymore. And the place where it stops being nice is around negative 2.6. Negative 2.6 to positive 2.6 more or less. So if we want to know what happens at five, for example, this approximation stops being reliable because around five, there's a very noticeable difference between this polynomial and this exponential function way up here. So the um, power functions are only ever going to approximate the more, or rather, let me rephrase that, the polynomials are only going to approximate the more complicated functions on limited intervals. Actual power functions, actual infinite degree polynomials, <clears throat> have the ability to approximate the function everywhere. Like if I had the ability to go out to infinity on Desmos, these two curves would be identical. In practice, where you, we can easily work with polynomials, and these curves are good approximations on a limited interval. But I mean, this is a limitation. It's something to be aware of, but also in most real world situations, your variable X can't be literally anything. Like if you're doing architecture and you're looking at an angle, 
I mean, make the angles in a building can vary a little, but like probably none of the angles in coil are greater than 90 degrees. We don't have weird rooms where the walls meet at 120 degree angles. So a theoretical architect or a theoretical engineer who's trying to study um, stuff in that context doesn't need X to be 100 or 200 or negative 20. There is just this limited interval from 0 to 90 that he's likely to care about. Um, when astro astronomers um, are studying binary star systems, they look some to measure sort of how easy it is with a telescope to distinguish two stars two um stars in a binary star system. They look at the angle. formed between the observer and the two stars, this angle is always very, very close to zero um, because the stars are so far away. Um, so again, this astronomer, you know, doesn't care what happens when that angle is negative, doesn't care what happens when that angle is large, is only interested in positive angles that are very close to zero. I mean, I'd say situations where you're not working on an interval, situations where you just want to look at the entire number line are very much the exception rather than the rule. So this somewhat awkwardly phrased restriction, it's trying to get at the idea that our um, variable needs to be limited, that it's not just going across the entire number line. And for most real world situations, that's going to be true. So it's a restriction, but it's not a restriction that comes up or that worries us in most applications. But of course, this is, um, I mean, a polynomial. I said that we would be looking at um, power series, at um, sort of super polynomials, infinite degree polynomials. Um, and it might seem, why should we look at power series if, um, if at the end of the day, we're going to use finite degree polynomials? Like if I want to approximate this exponential around here, I only need an eighth degree polynomial. So why do I want to talk about infinite degree polynomials? And I mean, we could probably figure that out if we thought about it a little. And in particular, if we asked, well, how, where did this polynomial come from? This polynomial comes from a power function. We take an infinite degree polynomial and we truncate it. So, Some comments working with power functions.
And let's start with the um, following observation. This is going to be a little vaguely stated, but power functions that look like this are said to have the number zero as their center. And maybe, maybe that uh, choice of word center makes perfect sense. You know, if we look here, this, I mean, it's not an entire power series, obviously, but the be this beginning of a power series, this uh, first five terms in a power series is doing a good job of approximating this function on an interval from about negative 2.4 to positive 2.4. And you see right in the center of this interval where the approximation is a good approximation, we find zero. We can have a variation. Instead of x to the n, we can have x minus c to the n. And this is going to have c as the center. And again, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I think trying to talk about this without it acknowledging the applications and discussing why we want to look at these is pretty futile, maybe. Um, so here is the start of a power series. We could keep going x squared raised to the fifth over five factorial Blah, blah. We could keep going forever. Obviously, I can only actually draw a um, finite number of things on, um, on Desmos. And this power series is approximating this polynomial, but it's only doing it near zero. So the more terms I add, the better the approximation becomes. But this approximation starts at zero and then spreads out. So imagine if I want to approximate e to the x squared near 10 for example, using a polynomial. Well, by messing with our viewing window a bit, I mean, our approximation is still going from good, from like negative 1.7, to positive 1.7. And the more terms I add, the better the approximation becomes, and the wider the interval it's good at becomes. But this interval is not getting wider very quickly, is it? 
I mean, now maybe it's good from negative two to positive two. So if I want to know what's happening at 10, and I want to just keep adding perms until my approximation becomes good at 10, I'm going to be adding dozens, if not hundreds, of perms. So the point of having a center other than zero is that our approximation will be good at the center and then spread out. If I want it to use an approximation around 10, I would use 10 as my center. If our um, architect wants to approximate around 90 degrees, they would use 90 degrees as their center, and so on. So the idea of a center is very closely related to this idea. The center of the power series should be in the interval you're interested in. Any questions about this sort of conceptually? Then as far as working with power series, I'm going just for simplicity to work with power series centered at zero, but everything I say um, for the next few minutes is also true for power series centered somewhere else. If two power series converge at some point. So do I phrase this um This is maybe something I should be putting off towards until Taylor series when we can talk about it more. Um, more. No, I, I know how to talk about this. The way to talk about this is to remember that these power series are defining functions. If f of c and g of c are both defined, so is f plus g of c. And this addition is done in the natural way. That is to say, f of c is an infinite series. g of c is another infinite series. Um, in general, trying to work with infinite series as if they were finite series is a recipe for heart rate. But if these were finite 
polynomials, you'd just add the coefficients, and that works with these infinite series as well. Just add the coefficients. So we can add our series. We can subtract them. I mean, addition and subtraction are always so similar in the calculus that it never really makes sense to think of it as a separate case. Um, you add and subtract as if they were finite polynomials. Um, you also multiply as if they were finite polynomials. This is less good news, though, because multiplying finite polynomials is a nuisance. I mean, imagine taking a 10th degree polynomial and multiplying it by another 10th degree polynomial. You'd have to do like about a hundred multiplications and then combine the like terms. But if we have one power series, And we want to multiply it by another power series. We can do this multiplication systematically. By which I mean this product is going to be a power series. The power series is going to have as a constant term a sub zero, b sub zero. That's true of polynomial. Right. If you multiply two polynomials, the constant term of the product is the product of the constant terms. Then what about x to the first terms? Well, we'll have a sub zero times b sub one x. And we'll have b sub zero times a sub one x. So that's going to be our constant term. Let's, let's write this power series, not our constant term, our linear term. So let's write this power series vertically. We'll have our constant term a0, b0, plus that linear term. So to find the quadratic term, well, we look at all of the combinations that could give us a quadratic. So a constant times a quadratic will give us a quadratic. So we'll have an a0, b2, and a b0, a2. And then a linear term, I mean, a, um, yes, a linear term and a linear term will give us a quadratic.
And I think that's everything. Um, yes. Yes, that's everything. So these are the ways we could get a quadratic term. And again, although we don't necessarily do it exactly like this, this is how addition works for finite polynomials. I mean, if you if these stopped being power series, if I erased these dot dot dots and said we just have two third degree polynomials, this is how you'd find the constant of the product. This is how you'd find the linear term of the product, and so on. So we are just doing the same thing that we do for polynomials. It's just that, I see I'm about out of time, it's just that with polynomials, we normally don't think of it this way. With polynomials, we normally just do all of the multiplications, and then at the end, we combine like terms. Well, with power series, we can do all the multiplications because there are an infinite number of terms. So we have to instead combine the like terms as we go. So we'll continue power series um, tomorrow.